they'll be back. Um, and um, I, it's my privilege to introduce Ron. Ron, why don't you kind of come on up here? Um, Ron is, uh, first of all, before I get into his numerous titles and all his accomplishments, um, Ron is a friend. Uh, we've known each other for probably a couple of decades. And I actually, um, how we met is I was leading worship at a women's retreat, which is weird. But I was, I was, and uh, our church, we were pressing into life in the spirit. We were reading a book by Jack Deere called Surprised by the Spirit. And uh, it was in some ways causing some fracturing in, in, our, in our church and people were confused. And um, I was at this women's retreat and met Wanda and she prayed, her and Jill Randall prayed over me and Trina and we met and uh, the Walborns have been mentors to uh, Trina and I uh, for a long time when it comes to things of the spirit. And uh, we've had the privilege of going some places together. And uh, Ron is not just a husband, a uh, dad. He's a grandparent. He's running a marathon next month. Uh, he, he, travels, he travels the globally speaking. He just got back from Vietnam speaking to uh, church leaders there in Vietnam. He's just had incredible doors open to him. And so I'm super grateful that uh, you could be here with us this week, Ron, because actually there's no other person that I would love to help us get started in reigniting some of these flames of the deeper, deeper life here in, in our district. Uh, Ron does happen to be the dean of Alliance Theological Seminary. Um, so he's, uh, he's leading there in New York City and um, has been doing that. How many years have you been? Um, 23. Okay, 23 years. He's been a pastor, so he was uh, pastoring in Risen King in Redding, California for some years. And um, I'm just really thrilled that you're here to teach this week and talk to us. Uh, but let me pray for you before you dive in sure. and, and do that. Lord, thanks for Ron. And um, Holy Spirit, come. We ask for a fresh feeling for him. And collectively, those of us who are listening, um, we ask, Lord, would you give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us tonight and this week? Would you unblock in Jesus' name anything that would block us from the things that you would want to speak to us? I pray there'd be freedom, that Ron would just sense freedom in this place, and that he would just um, enjoy these next days that he gets to be with us. I pray that you would your peace and your love and your joy. I pray all anxiety in Jesus' name and worry would be lifted off of him. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray that um, the burdens that he carries, we just, we just cut them off in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We just, I pray that he would sense a lightness in his spirit. And just uh, even uh, a, as he pours himself out into us, that you would do a pouring out into him that leads him to a uh, fresh perspective on what he faces uh, in his day-to-day -day, um, work that he gives himself to. We can't wait to hear from you tonight, Lord. So bless my friend Ron, I pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Steve. Where's Greta? <clears throat> Greta, um, there's a warrior anointing on you. You have authority. Don't ever shrink back from that authority. As you were leading worship, it felt like a hammer was uh, demolishing chains on people and falling off. And some of it was for me. As I was over there, I just felt a lightness come off my back. And I went, man, there's authority. And there's a warrior spirit there. So uh, thank you for bringing that. Don't ever back off on it. Keep going. So cool. Well, greetings. Sorry, I had to give that word to Greta. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I uh, bring you greetings from uh, President Rajan Matthews. He's the pre new president of our institution a little over a year. Uh, the first non-Anglo president Nyack Alliance University has had in 140 years, so it's about time. And, uh, and uh, uh, things are going well. We're still standing. A tough time to be in Christian higher ed, but I see some of my students out here, and uh, we got a demon guy over here. We got a master's guy over here. And uh, so it's, it's great to see you, great to be with you. Uh, I also brought with me one of your own. Uh, Jessica Mitchell is here. <laughs> Salem girl. And Jessica is such a joy to work with. Uh, now she's a Brooklyn girl. 
She even starts to talk like a Brooklyn girl now, you know? And she is the director of our online programming, and she's just doing a phenomenal job. And so I just feel like uh, we're benefiting from this district and your spirit. And I do feel like there's a kindred spirit between the Pacific Northwest and the Metro District. And there's always been that connection. And so uh, praise the Lord. So thank you for inviting me. I want you to stand with me, and we're going to start with another prayer. And it's a prayer for these next three days, two and a half, however, however many we're getting. And, um, and here's, here's the prayer, and uh, I'll, I'll feed it to you one line at a time. And I can't remember who I stole this prayer from, but I stole it from somebody. It might have been Mike Bickle, but I can't remember, so it's mine now. <laughs> and now it can be yours. But the prayer goes like this, Dear Lord Jesus, do anything you need to do in me that you might do everything you want to do through me. And when you pray that prayer, you are opening up the doors of your life to say, Jesus, Spirit of Jesus, come in, do anything. And so pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, do anything you need to do in me that you might do everything you want to do through me. Let's do it one more time. Dear Lord Jesus, do anything you need to do in me that you might do everything you want to do through me. <clears throat> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you heard that prayer. And so we invite you to manifest your presence in this place during these next three days. Come, Holy Spirit, as it's been already prayed, we welcome you. We welcome you. We rest in your presence right now. Thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> it was in uh, 1998, I was in Lima, Peru with a group of 20 Alliance pastors. And we went down there and we were working in this very poor neighborhood, uh, helping the churches, doing leadership training, doing some evangelistic outreach. And um, on a Sunday morning, I got tasked with preaching at this church that had um, dirt floors. It had basically uh, tarps hanging with scripture verses written on the tarps. And, and uh, there were probably 200 people crammed in, into this little area. And I was preaching on the filling of the Spirit. I wasn't preaching on healing. And so I was kind of surprised at the end when I gave the invitation. And this little girl, probably 9, 10 years of age, stood up. She waited for her mom to stand up, and then she grabbed her mom's arm, and her mom led her to the front. I could tell she was blind. And, uh, and I confess, I'm, I'm up in the front going, oh, man, I hope she wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because uh, I didn't have faith to pray for a blind girl. And I went down there, and through the translator, um, I don't speak much Spanish, un poquito, you know. And uh, through the translator, I asked, what do you want Jesus to do, to do for you? And she said, I want to see. I said, okay, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, which is a prayer we've prayed way too often, not expecting it to get answered, right? And so I put my hands on her cheeks and I, I put my thumbs on her eyes and I started to pray. And I confess, I didn't feel a lot of anointing. I didn't feel any manifestation. I just said, Jesus, you're the healer and started to pray, which by the way, that's why I always ask that question. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Because I don't want anyone to think that I can do it. It's him. He's, a, he's our healer. And uh, all of a sudden, I noticed uh, she was crying, and her tears started to wet my hands. And then she pushed my hand aside, and she started to read the verses on the wall in Spanish. I found out later she had been born, obviously, able to see, learn to read, and had lost her eyesight to some kind of disease or disorder like the year before. And so then she's crying, her mom's crying, my translator's crying. She runs out the back, her mom runs after her, my translator runs after them, which I don't know why he left me. They didn't need a translator. I needed the translator, so I'm up in the front going, fuego, you know, mas senor, and it worked. And, uh, and I thought, it's a little rude. She left, you know, remember the lepers that just took off? But then she came back in about 10 minutes, and she was holding hands with this middle-aged man who I found out was her father. And her father had walked away from the Lord out of bitterness for his daughter losing her sight. And so when she got healed, the first thing she wanted to do is say, hey, Daddy, look what Jesus did. And we saw the second miracle that morning as that man surrendered his life to the Lord. So 
I had a conversation with God on my way back to Reading. I was living in Reading at the time in 98. And my question was, God, why do I have to go to Lima, Peru to see that kind of power? Because we were not seeing the kind of power. And you know how it is. You go on a mission trip and God shows up. And you come home and it feels like we hit a block. And the Lord spoke to me on that plane ride back. And what he said to me is, Ron, you don't understand. Where you were, they have no access to medicine, to doctors, to all the, the resources that you have. I am their only hope. But you, in America, you have so many other options that I have become the God of the last resort. And I sensed in my spirit that God was grieved, that he does not want to be the God of the last resort. And so I started to think through, God, what is causing this? Because there's good people here in America, devout, devout, devout you know, completely, the devotion to the Lord is unquestionable, but it's like we don't see his power flow. And tonight I want to talk about a weird title. It, it's called Modernity and Worldview and their impact on spiritual power, because I think the times and seasons in which we live have robbed us of our spiritual worldview, our biblical worldview, and, and we are waiting in this. Now, when I use the term modern or modernity, I, I don't want you to think of that term as now, in this moment. Uh, most social theorists will tell you we've already passed through modernity. We've been impacted by it. We still bear the imprints of that season on our soul, but it's, it's affected the way we view the world, the way we view reality. And our worldview is by and large Western, rational, scientific. Um, and as much as you may go to church and as much as you may read your Bible, we have been soaking more in this culture, in this atmosphere, than we have in the spiritual, supernatural environment, culture, atmosphere of the scriptures. And so it's robbed us. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I used to read that verse and think of it with kind of an eschatological hermeneutic that he means uh, blessed are those who get holy and pure because one day they're going to die and go to heaven and see God. But I think he had something much more immediate in mind in that verse. I think what he had in mind was this, blessed are the pure, the undivided, the unencumbered in heart for they will perceive God wherever they are in the present moment. See, I think Jesus is calling for his disciples both then and now to have their eyes open to a spiritual reality that is here and present. And as Paul said, it's more real. The eternal is more real than the natural. So right now, we're kind of post-COVID. So reach out and poke your neighbor in the shoulder. Be gentle. Don't be mean, okay? You may have just stuck your finger through an angel. Now, it's possible there might be a critter in here too, so be gone in Jesus' name. Because we all know there's a spirit realm. It's here. And it's more real than the neighbor's shoulder that you just touched. And so the reality is, how do we kind of uh, deprogram ourselves from that soaking in modernity, from soaking in that Western rationalistic worldview, and begin to open our eyes to see the power of God in a fresh way? So uh, I want to start with uh, kind of a little history lesson here. And um, not moving, guys. Help me out, okay? So um, I'm going to be, tonight is going to be like a teaching. And so forgive me, it's going to be like you're in a seminary classroom. Now the old adage is, preaching is for transformation, teaching is for information. Well, let me tell you, both better have information and transformation. And so hopefully there'll be some transformation with the information. But there's some information here tonight that we got to wade through. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't have much in terms of history prior to 2500, and that's because the Sumerians invented writing in 2500, and that's when uh, ancient history begins. And as these epics change, there's often an invention like writing or other inventions that kind of shift the times and seasons of the world. Now, the ancient world, uh, that's the time and era of the great empires, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians. Um, that, that's the time and era of the biblical narrative, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and so we see from 2,500 to 500. Now, about 325, there was a guy named Constantine that kind of shifted things. 
And if you remember, Constantine uh, kind of brought Christianity into this being the state religion. And we'd say, wow, that's good news. They're no longer going to be thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. But the problems began at that point with the church being connected with political power. And it, it was in that season we started to lose our spiritual perception. And so from 500 to 1500, we have the dark ages, the medieval world. It's not a very bright spot in church history. And part of that has to do with the power and the riches that the church began to accumulate. There's a story told that when uh, Francis of Assisi, Francis was a bright spot in, in this era, uh, right in the middle of the Crusades, God raised up Francis. And he, was, he went to the Vatican one time and the Pope said, look, Francis, no longer do we have to say silver and gold have we none. And Francis's response to that was, yes, but neither can you say, rise up, take up your bed and walk. You've lost your power. And so during the, the Dark Ages, we see kind of the decline of that. Now, in 1500, there's again an invention that comes about. Anybody know what was invented in 1500 that changes the clock? The printing press. Good. I was doing this one time in a class, and a kid went, the catapult. <laughs> you need to go back and take ancient history again, brother. Okay. Um, and so that ushers us into the modern world. Again, Modern is used by social theorists, not as being now in the moment, but it's an era that we pass through. And so, hence, we now live in what we've called post-modernity. Okay? Now, but I want to talk about modernity here for a minute. So, initially, I mean, how many of you know the church doesn't deal well with change? You don't like change, you know? Why can't we just get back to normal? Okay? Um, but that doesn't seem to be God's plan. And so when the printing press came along, you'd think, man, the church is going to jump on this. They're going to use this. And yet the people that said, hey, let's teach people to read. Let's print the Bible in the language of the people. They got burned at the stake by the church. Because the church wanted the power of the priest being the only educated person and the people having to come to the church to find out what God's word said. And so they were most resistant to it. Now, we usually get over it and then like a pendulum that swings too far, we go to the other extreme. And so by the end of modernity, we became known as the religion of the book, which again, I have a high view of scripture and I value God's word. It is our light. It is our life. But it is never meant to be an end in and of itself. It's to lead us into relationship to the one who is the end, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so modernity has had an impact on us in several ways. So first of all, during this time, we see a movement from theism to deism to naturalism. Let me define those terms. Theism is a belief in a God who created everything that exists, and he is still here, present, and intimately involved in this reality. And that's the God of the Bible. But during the scientific revolution, during the rise of naturalism, we began to discover how the world works and what is going on behind the scenes. And we went, oh, we really don't need that God. And so deism began to rise. Now, deism is a belief in a God or a intelligent designer or a first cause that started it all. But then that deity or that first cause set up natural laws and left. He is now completely disconnected with that reality. Now, the reason they hang on to this idea of God is that it's nice to have the thought that maybe there's something out there. And grandma believed in God, so we hang on to the idea, the concept. And so our prayers become perfunctory and ritualistic, but there's no power because we don't believe in a God that is active in here and now. Well, the problem with deism is it's not a stable worldview. James Sire has a wonderful book called The Universe Next Door. If you get a chance to read it, it's great. And, and what he says is because deism is a blending of some theism with some naturalism, it's not stable and you can't stay there for long. You're either going to have to reject the idea of God altogether and go full on into naturalism, or you're going to have to come back to a God that is here, present, with us, involved. And so this deism is not uh, necessarily sustainable. And we've seen the slide into naturalism so that now uh, the number one uh, religion, in a growing religion in America, when they do the surveys, are none. No faith claim. No 
uh, religious affiliation. And so we've seen that this increased naturalism culminates in this God is dead philosophy. And this, Dostoevsky said this, if in a culture God is dead, then everything will become permissible. And we're seeing that. Now, I will tell you, there's a silver lining to this. And the silver lining is that sinners are now living with more integrity than ever before. Now, what I mean by that is they're not pretending to be something they're not. I mean, when I was growing up, even if you didn't go to church, even if you, you know, had no relationship with God, you at least pretended that you did. Because it was kind of the thing to do in the 60s and the 70s. Well, except for some movements there. But the reality is nobody's faking it anymore. And they're kind of coming out of the closet, not just about homosexuality, but about everything. And so we're seeing that happen. And the good, I was doing this talk one time, and this older lady said, I know, and they make lousy neighbors. And so I talked to her afterwards. I, I what do you mean by that? She goes, well, my other neighbors were Mormon. And I know they weren't the kind of believers that we want them to be, but at least they voted with me. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad they voted with you, I think. Uh, I don't know who she voted for. I could suspect. But, <laughs> but I said, but now you have an opportunity to live out the gospel with your neighbors who it turns out were using drugs and were doing some things that were making her very uncomfortable. But the reality is we haven't adjusted to that reality too well. Now, this thing has affected the church as well. This living in this scientific, naturalistic kind of atmosphere. And one of the things we've done is we've picked the tools of the era to fight the Christian battles. Now, please hear me. I'm not against Christian scientists. I'm not against, you know, Christians kind of using the tools of an era to do apologetics, to do that kind of work. I think it's necessary. But I think we fail to realize that when you begin to pick up the tools of the era, you begin to be discipled and mentored by that era. And it begins to change the way you think about your reality. And the result is you begin to lose your perception of a biblical or spiritual worldview. And so I think what's happened is we have a lot of Christians in the Western world, and I'll pick on the U.S. here, that say they are theists, but they live like deists. No, they, they can pass a theology exam. God created everything. He is still here. He is still actively involved. But they don't pray. They have no expectancy that this God can invade their reality and do a miracle and do healings. And so the result is a large portion of the church in America has developed this God is dead or God in a box theology, okay? And in fact, you can go to seminaries in Christian colleges around this land where they will teach you a theology of why God doesn't do that anymore. Now, the good news is not at Alliance Theological Seminary. Um, I mean, you could take a course in power encounter. You could take a course in divine healing. You could take a course in spiritual formation and spiritual gifts because that's who we are. I, I'll tell you a story about that that makes me sad. I was in Africa a few years ago. And I was talking with one of the African PhDs in theology over there who had been a pastor, had been very bright, very intelligent. We brought him over. He got a scholarship, uh, got a master of divinity, got a PhD, and now was back leading the seminary. And we were talking one night and he said, um, is it true that at ATS you have a course in power encounter? I go, yeah. You have a course in healing? Yeah. He said, you know, we used to do that stuff. That's how I grew up. We were casting out demons. We were healing the sick. We saw all kinds of power. I said, what changed? He said, I got an education. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you went off and you got your rational Western theological education and you lost your biblical spiritual worldview. I said, but it's time to get it back. And I got to pray with that man and, and free him from kind of the curse that he got through his theological education in the West that has this presupposition that God doesn't do that anymore. And so the reality is uh, we have been impacted far more than we realize. There's a great quote by Bill Johnson. He says this, There are many concepts that the church holds dear, desiring to maintain a devotion to Scripture. But some of these actually work against the true value of God's Word. 
For example, many people who reject the move of the Holy Spirit have claimed that the church doesn't need signs and wonders because we have the Bible. Now, uh, you all know your leaders, he's talking about cessationism. And what cessationism believes is that when, 1 Corinthians says, when the perfect comes, it means the canon of Scripture. And when the perfect comes, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit anymore. But if you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 13, it says what the perfect is when it says, then we will see him face to face. And so the perfect is coming, but he hasn't come yet. And so we need all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need to move in the supernatural power of the Spirit of Christ like never before. And so Bill Johnson goes on and he says, that teaching contradicts the very word it seeks to exalt. Help me, guys. There it is. If you assign 10 new believers the task of studying the Bible to find God's heart for this generation, not one of them would conclude that spiritual gifts are not for today. You have to be taught that stuff. Now catch this next sentence. The doctrine stating that signs and wonders are no longer needed because we have the Bible was created by people who hadn't seen God's power and needed an explanation to justify their own powerless churches. Every time I read that, that makes me go, ouch. Because when you live without the power of God long enough, you create a theology that fits your level of experience. And it creates a status quo mentality. And that's why we need a prophetic generation. We need a prophetic people that will begin to critique our culture, our worldview more by the word of God, a spiritual worldview than what we've been living with and soaking in. But it's not easy. Because you start critiquing the culture, critiquing the worldview, critiquing the atmosphere that has pervaded even in the church, um, you end up getting stoned like prophets, okay? Because when you begin to speak the truth against the status quo, when people have something to lose, they'll resist the change. And the system of religion is pretty strong. And so we've got to break through that process. Now, let me give you a couple definitions here, and then we'll move to some real practical uh, uh, concepts. Worldview. I've talked about it. Let me give you a definition. This comes from Sire's book. Worldview is a set of presuppositions which we hold about the basic makeup of our world. Now, here's the thing about your worldview. You don't even realize you have one until you meet somebody that doesn't have the same worldview. And so, you walk along kind of clueless. Of course, this is how everybody views reality. Uh, this happened to me down in Lima, Peru. Uh, I'm down there, and I was invited to preach at a church uh, at a service that started at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. I show up, 6.30. I'm a good American. I have a watch on, okay? And I show up on time. I'm, you know, prompt. Well, there's nobody at the church. The doors are locked. Nobody shows up till like 7, 7.15. The worship team shows up. And they start setting up. And then about 7.30, 7.45, the pastor shows up. And I said, hey, what time is this service? He went seven-ish. I'm like, huh? So finally, the people start getting there about 8.15. Now, um, at first, I was irritated. But then I realized we could learn some things from those people. Because when they did get there, they were fully present. They weren't on their cell phones. They weren't distracted. They were fully present. And could it be that they were late because they were fully present with the people they had been with before? Again, who says there's only one way of viewing the world? Another example of this is found in this map. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen this uh, map of the world. Oops, go back for me one. I hit it prematurely, okay? What is wrong with this map? Well, you think it's upside down, but my friend from Australia saw it, and he went, finally, mate, you got it right. Okay? <laughs> Australia's front and center. Now, how many of you also know that even if this map is flipped right side up, it's distorted? It's a distortion of reality. Cartographers have been decreasing the size of Africa, decreasing the size of South America, and inflating the size of Europe and the U.S. for years. I mean, is it any wonder we're the most ethnocentric culture in the world? We think we're the center of the universe. And yet, the alliance was birthed to be a global movement. And so we are people that have to understand that while God loves America, he does not love America more than he loves the rest of the world. And we've got to open up our eyes to see that spiritual reality. Well, let me keep going. 
Second definition. This is a tough one. This comes from a missionary anthropologist that I had at Fuller, a great man. And, and he talked about the flaw of the excluded middle. Now, let me read you the definition, and then I'll kind of unpack it, and I'll try to put the cookies on the low shelf, because this is, this is tough. He says this, uh, a growing acceptance of platonic dualism during modernity caused the belief in the middle zone to fade away. A new science based on materialistic naturalism emerged. The end result was a secularization of science and a mystification of religion with no connection between the two worlds. Now, let me kind of explain with this chart uh, what he means. Go ahead and go to the next slide, guys. Now, in this chart, what, what Hebert is saying is that we in the Western world have developed our secular science mentality in the here and now, what we can see and taste and test. Um, but God has been removed from that realm. And we relegate the spiritual realm to the realm out there, but there's no connection. Hence, the flaw of the excluded middle. And Hebert, when he was a missionary in India, had these new believers come to him and say, you know, missionary, you need to pray for our kids because since we started to follow Jesus, our relatives are putting curses on us and we need you to break the curses and help our kids get well. And Hebert's going, okay, we have some medicine for your kids. And I can pray to a God that's out there. And he realized that these people, even in their animistic worldview, had a middle realm where the three realms were really connected. And even though we are supposed to have a connected spiritual realm, really it's one realm and God is over it all, we have this middle zone that has been excluded and lost. And what it is, is deism. We are practicing deism in the Western church because there seems to be no connection to the God that's out here and what's going on in reality. And so the flaw of the excluded middle kind of explains it. All right. So what are the factors? Here's where I want to get practical. Um, and how do we begin to change this in our local church? Okay, so these are the things that we've got to address. First of all, let me hit worldview again, but from the scriptures. Because I want to say something about critiquing culture with the culture of the scripture, with the worldview of the scripture. And I want to show you how Paul does this. Um, in Acts chapter 14, it says this, In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. Now, catch this. If this guy gets healed, and you know he does because we've read the book before, um, and he starts to walk, there's not just a restorative miracle on the lame legs. There's a rehabilitative miracle. Because he didn't have to go through the toddler stage and learn how to walk. He got up walking instantly. And so he listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. How do you see that somebody has faith? It was a guy laying on a pallet going, hey, pick me. Well, the text doesn't suggest that. The text suggests that Paul's moving in a prophetic gifting. Paul's moving in a word of knowledge. Paul's moving in kind of a word of wisdom. And he sees faith on this guy. Now, is it just me? Or do we not teach that kind of stuff in our Western models of discipleship? I don't think we do. We sing songs about it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. But we don't build it into our discipleship. And I think it's time that we begin to intentionally create a culture in our church where we are encouraging our people to see in the Spirit and hear in the Spirit and begin to move in what the biblical worldview says is our rightful atmosphere. It's who we are. It's what we were made for. And so he goes on in this text. He says, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in a Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. And Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And if you remember, they start to worship them because their worldview said only the gods out there can do miracles. And so if there's a miracle happening, then God, these guys must be God. That was their worldview. So Paul goes, no don't worship us. He throws dirt on him. No, no, I'm not God. 
In fact, I want to preach to you a gospel where Jesus Christ empowers ordinary people like me, like you, to do the supernatural. And so what he has to do so that the gospel can permeate this culture is he has to critique their worldview and take it apart and show them the real worldview that Jesus is bringing. Now, here's where it gets tough. In my classrooms at Alliance, at ATS, I have so many different cultures represented. Um, I've got people from South America. I've got people from the Caribbean. I've got people from Africa. I've got people from Asia. I mean, it's just, I have all these cultures. And I tell them, listen, you guys have to do this for your culture. Because as a white man, I can't go to an African culture and critique it because I get my own worldview mixed up with that and I start to be a little colonial. And so you guys have to take this initiative to begin to go to that Chinese church and say, listen, you guys have made this all about the head, the rational, and you've lost the sense of expectancy that the spirit wants to move in the supernatural. And you got to critique the culture when control is one of their values and willing to surrender to the work of the spirit has been lost. And so we've got to do that. Now listen, Americans, it's time for us to do that with our culture. You see, when the church gets in bed with the state and with politics, we lose our prophetic voice. And we're trying to recapture that, to make America great again, to do all this stuff. And friends, listen, I want America to be great again, but I want it to be great in the spirit. I want it to be the kingdom of God that advances. And so we've got to begin to say, how do we critique the materialism, the hunger for power and control with the gospel? And we've got to have a spiritual worldview to, in order to do that. And we've lost it. I think that's why so much of the church, and let me be fair, I think we get duped and deceived on the right side of this. And I think we get duped and deceived on the left side of this as well. And so we've got to be a people that are allowing the, our minds and our spirits and our souls to be permeated with the economy and the atmosphere of the kingdom of God and, and the spiritual and the supernatural uh, presence of, his, of him, him in, in everything we do. All right, let me move on. So first of all, the worldview issue. Secondly, the other thing that impacts us is the limitations of our experience. So, you know, I'm sitting here and many of you have grown up like I grew up where I didn't see much of this stuff. And, um, and we had, when I was a kid, we had some of the Jesus people, crazy charismatics come to church, long haired hippies and Maranatha. And I remember being a little freaked out, you know, as a preacher's kid. And, but they had a worldview that says, oh, Jesus is doing supernatural stuff all the time. And to be honest, my dad embraced them. And so we had a mixture of old gray-haired alliance people in Western PA and a bunch of hippies that had just got filled with the spirit and the Jesus people movement. And so I got to see it. I got to see my friend when he was 12 healed of cancer. And so I had that DNA in me because we have that DNA in the alliance. It's who we are. But what happens is we see people that go from the extreme, the pendulums over here, we're not using the gifts, and they go way over here and they abuse the gifts. And when we see the excess and when we see that, we go, oh, I'm going to swing back the other way. And I like to call it, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow in, in my seminar, but the 20th century is kind of the age of messy restoration, where the Lord restored tongues, and what a mess it created. And the Lord restored healing in the mid part of the century, and what a mess it created. And then prophecy came. I'm hoping we can get a little less messy in the 21st century and use everything God is restoring to the church and be a little healthier with it. But the limitations of our ex experience affect us. At Nyack, um, when we were Nyack, we had a guy from the West Coast. Some of you might know him, Terrence Nichols. Uh, I think he's a uh, black pastor from S San Francisco, I think is where he's at. And we brought him out to do our deeper life. And he was preaching and when he finished preaching, he started giving prophetic words to some of our students. And we were in the gymnasium. It was packed. And then he started calling people up. And I'm like, oh, I thought this guy was Alliance. He is Alliance, but he's, he was moving in the spirit. And he starts praying for people, and people start falling down. 
And we didn't know what to do. The first three people bounced on the gym floor. We didn't know enough to catch them, you know. And, and so finally somebody said, maybe we should catch these people. Yeah, that'd be nice. So, you know, we sent some catchers up. We didn't know what we're doing. We're alliance, okay? And, uh, and all of a sudden this, and I'm, I'm in, in the back. And I'm standing there watching. And my wife was the director of spiritual formation at the time. And all of a sudden this alliance preacher's daughter, her name was Kelly. I won't tell you her last name. She came running up to me and she literally grabbed me by the shirt and she said, Dr. Walborn, you need to get up there and stop this right now. I go, why? Why do you think I should stop it? She said, I have been in church my whole life and I've never seen anything like this. This can't be of God. Now I knew the church she grew up in. I'd been there. So I asked her a few questions. I said, Kelly, tell me about your church. When's the last time you saw somebody get saved there? She goes, oh, it's been a long time. We don't give altar calls anymore. I said, when was the last time you baptized anyone? She goes, oh, I can't remember. In fact, we store our sound equipment in our baptismal tank. I'm like, oh, that's a nice, safe, dry place for electrical equipment, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How bad is that? Ichabod. Okay. Um, I said, when was the last time you saw somebody get healed in your church? Oh, no, 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 we don't do that. You see, we've reacted so much against the excess that we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And so I said to Kelly, I said, Kelly, listen, you don't think this is Jesus, but let's go up and see what God's doing. And she goes, okay, you have to go with me though. She was scared. Limitations of experience. So we go over in the front and there's this one black young man, a student, just laid, laying there peacefully. And so Kelly and I pull a chair up. She's white. I'm white. And uh, you know how when you, even if you have your eyes closed, you can tell somebody's looking at you? So this guy's laying there. All of a sudden, he opens one eye. Two white people were staring down at him, scared him. And he goes, can I help you? I said, um, we're just kind of watching to see what Jesus is doing. So keep receiving. But when you're done, could we talk to you? He goes, sure. Closes his eyes. Ten minutes later, he sits up. What was going on? He said, well, I came to Nyack to train to be a pastor. But I've been running from my calling. I switched my major to business, and I know I'm running. And tonight, Jesus convicted me. He wants my life, and I surrendered to him. And I look over, Kelly's crying, and I go, Kelly, does that sound like Jesus to you? She goes, it does, but it's so weird. <laughs> See, friends, we've replaced discernment with our comfort zone. And whatever we're comfortable with, that's God. But if anything makes us uncomfortable... Oh, no, that's not of God. Listen, God's about to demolish your comfort zone. And that's okay. Because our comfort zone is not advancing the kingdom. I think the Lord, I think the Lord wanted to use COVID to shake us out of our comfort zone. I think rather than return to normal, he wants us to, to enter into a new reality where we do church differently than we've ever done it before where we don't just sit in a pew. One of the things, I didn't say this about the Constantine thing, is that that birthed attractional Christianity, where instead of living incarnationally and being salt and light in our communities, we built our cathedrals and we did our music and we invited people to come to us rather than us go to them. And you know, we are still suffering the effects of that in our culture where we have created these theaters in the round and we have to meet somewhere, I get it, but it's all about them coming to us. COVID was a time they couldn't come to us. And we have to think creatively, how are we going to change this? I don't think we can do it without a change in worldview. So limitations and experience. Third, uh, your personality or temperament can affect your Entering into the supernatural stuff. All right, so here's a little personality test. We don't have time to do Myers-Briggs or any other. So here, this is Ron Walborn's personality test. All right, ready? When you get into a pool of water, are you more likely to dip? Who's a toe dipper? Where's our toe dippers? You dip your toe in. I see you cautious people. Okay, toe dippers, you have a personality that's like, let's test this. Let's check, you know. Okay, All right, that's, that's one personality type. There's another personality type. We're the cannonball people. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I'm a cannonball. I look for the toe dippers and then I just run and do a cannonball and splash the toe dippers so that they get more than their toe wet, okay? Now, I have a word from the Lord for both groups. Toe dippers, 
Some of you have had such unholy caution, you never get in and swim. And I would say that this week, God's going to give you an opportunity to get in and swim. So don't stand on the side. Get in. Cannonball people. Some of us have jumped into pools with no water. <laughs> We've broken our legs and our, oh, you know. Oh. And, and here's the good news. God has grace for you. He loves the Peters that jump in. He loves it. And he'll heal you. And so don't stop jumping in. Listen, some of us, all of us who have waded in to this deeper life stuff, we've been wounded. We've been wounded by the abuse and the excess and crazy. And, and when we, we've been wounded by the religious people on the other side, and it, it makes you gun shy and you start to back off. Don't lose your radical edge. Keep jumping. Just ask him to give you discernment. Okay? All right. Fourth. Our will. Okay, pastors, hear me. We tend to be the ones that are most resistant to change. Because the people that are in control, if they perceive they have something to lose, they will resist it. And let me tell you what this looks like. The Spirit of God begins to move in a church across town. And we find a way to preach a sermon series on why that's not God. Why? Because we get afraid that we might lose some people. And the reality is, when you have kind of a vested interest in the status quo, you tend to resist it. Now, I made a commitment to the Lord years ago. I will never play it safe. And it's cost me. I mean, um, I mean we're, we're doing, you know, healing stuff, and we're doing this kind of stuff in the seminary. We have demons manifest. I mean, who thinks demons are going to show up at seminary? We have, we have to do deliverance all the time. And, uh, and I, had, I had people come to me and say, you know, you want enrollment. If you guys weren't so crazy, if you just became a, a normal evangelical seminary, more people would come. I go, but that's not what I'm called to. I am not called to produce normal evangelical pastors. That hasn't worked. I want radical, crazy, kingdom paradigm warriors. That's what I'm called to produce. And I believe if that's the mission God has called us to, he will give us students that have that kind of spirit. And that's the kind of people we're going to send out. Now, I do tell them, you may get fired because of what you learned here. Because they always stone the prophets. And so this prophetic generation is going to pay a price. But it's worth it. It's worth it because we're pursuing the king. We're pursuing the kingdom. All right. The other thing that affects us is the sin factor. Some of us think we're not seeing power because there's sin in our life. Well, I got news for you. There's sin in your life. That's the truth. Um, the reality is, uh, the scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. Um, it's the sin that we're burying and hiding and not being honest about that will cut us off. But the, the reality is God loves to use broken people who are still in the sanctification process. He loves to empower his people. Listen, years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, you do not have to be holy to walk in my power. But if you want to survive my power, you better get holy. See, there's, there's truth to that. You don't earn God's power by being, you know, good and getting rid. Listen, the sanctification of process, and I... I'm not going to talk about this this week. I believed a heresy about sanctification for many years. The heresy I believed was this. Salvation was God's job, but sanctification and getting holy was my job. And that was my response of gratitude to what God did in salvation. Well, that's a heresy. Jesus is the sanctifier, not me. And so my role in this process is to surrender and say, God... I am not yet where I should be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be, and I am your son, and I don't have to earn your power. I just get to say, come Holy Spirit, and you show up. We were talking the other night. Some of you may not know this, but one of the uh, kind of spark plugs, catalysts for the Jesus People Revival was a guy named Lonnie Frisbee. And then about 10 years after the Jesus People Revival, where Calvary Chapel just exploded in growth, he went to the vineyard that was kind of stuck in their early stages and they had a Holy Spirit night where God showed up. So Lonnie Frisbee sparked two significant revivals. And yet in the 90s, 
He was a man who could never overcome his drug addiction. He could never overcome his own lifestyle issues, and he died of AIDS at the age of about 50. Chuck Smith preached his funeral, and he said, Lonnie was a man that knew how to move in God's power like Samson, but like Samson, he had holes in his soul he could never fill. And so I'm not being soft on sin, but I'm saying this. God has a long history of using broken people to bring his power, to bring his freedom. Now, he loves to hit a moving target. So as you move out, he will begin to sanctify you and you will surrender to his work in your life. He will set you free. All right, so as we close, um, some of you have seen this picture. And in this picture, there are two women. There's an older woman and there's a younger woman. How many of you see both? Okay, okay, quite a few. Um, uh, let me help those of you that aren't seeing. The older woman is looking kind of in this direction at this group. Um, she has a rather large nose and her mouth is right down there on the bottom. And I don't know if this has a, oh yeah, there's her mouth. And uh, here's her eye. The young woman is looking away from me as young, beautiful women tend to do, okay? That's a, <laughs> I'm only mildly offended by that laughter, okay? And, and she's looking away, and she's got a feather out the top of her, you know, head there, and, and this is her ear and her jawline, and hopefully somebody hasn't slashed her throat. You know, it's a... Anyhow, they're both there. But if you don't have eyes to see it, you miss it. Another example of that. A few years ago, my wife said to me, honey, you always get to pick the cars. I want to pick the car this year. I said, what do you want? She said, I would like a Volvo. I went, oh, that sounds expensive. And they are. So we bought a used Volvo XC90. Uh, best car I've ever had. It's amazing. I love that car. It got horrible gas mileage, but it was a great car. But when we drove off the Volvo lot, all of a sudden I realized there's Volvos everywhere. I'd never noticed them before. Look, there's a, there was a sale on Volvos. Everyone bought one. Well, they'd always been there, but when you don't have eyes to see it, you miss it. And so friends, we need a paradigm shift. We need our eyes open in a new way. And that's kind of why we're here. Your people that are leaning in, your people that are saying, I want to jump in the pool. That's why I'm here. So how do we do it? Let me give you just four steps that I think can help you. I think, first of all, start with confession. Let's just admit that we've been affected by the Western worldview that we've grown up in. God, I'm sorry. I've made you too small in my eyes. Let's begin to lean in to the stuff that makes us nervous. And so one of the things you can do is begin to reread the scripture with kingdom lenses instead of our Western rational lenses only. I'm not saying we throw our rational thought process out the, the window. I think it's part of what God will use to awaken it. In fact, great book, write it down. Watch me knee, the release of the spirit. Because in that book, the release of the spirit is not the release of the Holy Spirit. It's the release of your spirit. And he says, God wants to break you of your over-reliance on your mind. Uh, because when you speak from the mind, you touch the mind of men. And he wants to break you of your over-reliance on your soul, your emotions. Because when you speak from your soul and emotions, you stir emotions. But he wants to break you of the over-dependence on those two sources. And he wants your spirit to be the source. And utilize your mind and your emotions as the tool of the spirit. And so what gets released is your spirit and you touch the spirit of people. And so it's not anti-intellectualism. It's not irrational. It's transrational where the spirit begins to control. Um, another thing on this, how many of us have preached Jesus calming the waters this way? Right now, brothers and sisters, there's a storm in your life. You just need to know that Jesus can calm the storm of your life. We allegorize it instead of saying, our God has authority over nature. And we're going to begin to pray for miracles in the natural realm. That's what Jesus was demonstrating. He doesn't just want to calm the storms of your life, although he does that too. But let's begin to reread the scripture with kingdom lenses instead of with this Western naturalistic kind of rationale. Third, create. And I'm commissioning you, create a believing community where the worldview accepts the excluded middle tier and observe what can happen when you do that. 
So as you begin to go back to your churches and say, hey, we're going to change some things. We're going to expect the Holy Spirit to show up on Sunday morning. We're going to do some ministry time. We're going to do some prayer time. We're not going to script it all, but we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to move. And you can create a community where God says, okay, they're making space for me. I'm going to show up. And I, I think he's waiting to show up in our churches. And then finally, I would encourage you to start by be, being more aggressive at praying for the sick. Why? Because it's in our DNA. I believe that it is the foundational DNA of who the Christian and Missionary Alliance is. A.B. Simpson believed that Jesus was restoring healing to the church. Now, let me push you on this. I think we should train and equip every single believer to pray for healing. Why? Because Jesus is the healer, not us. And Jesus is with us. One other thing on that, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Have you ever noticed in 1 Corinthians 12 that the only gift that's in the plural is healing, gifts of healing? Michael Green, the British theologian, says the reason for that could very well be that the person that has the gift of healing is the person that gets healed, not the person praying. Because gifts of healing are being distributed by the one and only healer, Jesus. I like that because it still believes in the gift of healing, but it doesn't center it in us. It centers in, in Jesus. And so the reality is, I think that's the easiest place to start. Now, let me tell you one last story. And then, um, and if you got that, I'll leave it up for a minute. And then you guys can shut it off in just a minute. I want to tell you the story of how God changed my paradigm. So I grew up in the CMA, preacher's kid. Uh, went to Nyack College. Um, was uh, two and a half years into my Master of Divinity degree uh, at ATS. But there was a longing in my heart that there had to be more. Because I saw, as a young man in my church, I saw hints of the power of God being released. And I, and I remember my favorite week of the year was when the missionaries would come and we would hear the stories about deliverance and we would hear stories about miracles and healings. And I remember sitting through those weeks where we heard the stories of Alliance missionaries who were like living what the Bible said we could live. And I went to my dad, I was probably 12. I go, hey dad, if you could get some of that stuff going here, people would come to this church. And he just looked at me and shook his head. I was a weird kid, but I was onto something. And so I had this longing, and I started in my first church, and um, I was in Stratford, Connecticut. And we were seeing some things happen. But by Christmas, I said to my wife, Is there's, if there's not some more power somewhere, I'm out. I can't do this. I'm going to go teach school. The money's better. And uh, out, out of the blue, my elders in this little alliance church heard about a conference in Anaheim, California called Signs and Wonders and the Kingdom of God. This was not an alliance conference. We did not tell the DS I was going. And they sent me to this conference. I took uh, another alliance guy with me who, just for safety, because, you know, <laughs> well, we, we were going to the left coast, you know, and, and, and we were nervous. I've lived here 10 years now. I'm not nervous about you. I like fruits and nuts. I'm, I'm into it, okay? But, um, but we were nervous. And so I took another alliance guy with me. And so we, we walk in the first night at the Anaheim Vineyard, and as soon as we walk in, my leg, my, I think it was started with my left leg, just started shaking wildly. And as soon as worship would end, it would stop. And, and, and then the next night I walked in and then both my legs start shaking. Finally I say, hey, Bill, Bill Randall was with me. I go, Bill, what's going on? He goes, I think God's shaking your leg. <laughs> Why is God shaking my leg? He goes, I don't know. Why don't you ask him? Ah. God, why are you shaking my leg, okay? Now, I do think I got an answer. I think what he was saying is, Ron, you need to know you're no longer in control. So that week on Tuesday, John Wimber preached a phenomenal sermon on healing. And it was, Jesus is the healer. Jesus is with every single one of you. Let's bring the healing ministry of Jesus to people. And, uh, and he invited people to stand up. And this guy stood up right in front of me. I was probably midway to the back. And this guy stood up. He was a United Methodist pastor from Lincoln, Nebraska. And he stood up because he had a tumor on his back that uh, had just come out of nowhere. He was going home. He was going to have it biopsied. He goes, but I would prefer it to be healed. 
So he literally pulled his shirt up and showed us the tumor. Who does that in church? Okay. I, I knew this was different. Okay. And uh, so, so people gather around him and they start to pray, but they started to pray in tongues. Now I didn't speak in tongues. I was a little afraid of people that spoke in tongues, but they're going in, you know, she bought a Honda, should have bought a Yamaha, you know, they're going in and, uh, <laughs> Or she bought a Hyundai, should have bought a Kia for the Koreans, you know. Okay. And uh, <laughs> we have a lot of Koreans at ATS. They like that joke. Um, and so they're, they're going in, they're praying. And I, I kind of step away from the group because, you know, I was uncomfortable. And so I step away and I, I stand like this. Now, this is a position we teach in seminary. <laughs> where if you have no idea what's going on, if you just stand like this and rock back and forth, you will look spiritual and you will look like you know what you're doing. And you're laughing now because you saw both Monty and Steve standing like that before. The, this, <laughs> who's cracking up? They set me up for that, you know? So I'm standing there and all of a sudden, my right hand gets really hot. And so I, I lean over to Bill Randall. I go, my hand just got hot. And I said it a little bit too loud because the lady who was leading the ministry time said, well, that's because you're supposed to lay your hand on the tumor. Now, what went through my mind is, there's no freaking way I'm touching that tumor. <laughs> but before I could say that, she grabbed my hand and she stuck it on the tumor and she goes, pray. <laughs> and she sounded like that. She sounded a little like Joyce, Joyce Meyer. I was afraid of her. So, so here's what I did. I said, uh, dear Lord Jesus, all I have is English. <laughs> and they're rolling their eyes like, that. oh boy. <laughs> Oh, there's an anointed prayer. All I have is English, but I do believe you are the healer. And that tumor shrunk under my hand. And it was a little tiny, tiny mark where it had been, but it was gone. And they're going nuts. Yabba dabba do. You know, they're going crazy. You know, <laughs> they take tongues to a whole new level. I sit down in a chair and I'm going, habit, 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 habit. But it wasn't tongues. It was my worldview being demolished. It was my comfort zone being demolished. And I, I wrote in my journal that night, how did this happen? Maybe because there was no air conditioning, that the lymph system drained the tumor, you know, because it was hot. And do you understand? Listen, preacher's kid, grew up in the Alliance, went to a Christian college, almost done with my master of divinity. But I had been discipled more by a Western worldview than the scriptures. And that's when God changed my life forever. I've never gone to church the same way. In fact, I never go anywhere the same way because he is here. He is present and he's waiting to invade our world through you as you bring the kingdom wherever you go. I'd like the worship team to come up. Will you stand with me? So I'd like to invite you to do something that my kids have done their whole lives. They'll come up to me when they were little and they hold their hands out and I know they want candy. As they get older, they want money. As they get older, they want the keys to the car. And they're all gone now. And don't tell them I said this, but I miss it. I miss it because nothing triggers your father heart, your parent heart. Like when your kids say, Daddy, I need you. I need something from you. Would you just extend your hands? There he is. Yeah, sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Rest on your sons and daughters right now. removing fear. He's, he's removing people pleasing right now. He's setting you free to do what the Father's doing. Right now in Jesus' name, we break off the spirit of religion that has robbed you of the power of God. We break it off in Jesus' name.
some of you right now are experiencing some manifestations in your body. Some of you may even be experiencing your hands getting a little hot. Lord, I, I, I just speak an impartation for the healing ministry of Jesus over this place. It doesn't mean anything if you're not having manifestations. He can drop it on you whether you know it or not. Lord, touch them. Come on, bring impartation for healing in this district. Restore the healing ministry of Jesus in this region, in the alliance, Lord. Let us once again be known as a movement that believes and practices healing. May sick people, may wounded people, may broken people begin to run to us and help us not to push them away. saw a name uh, on a church sign that said Triage Alliance Church. I'm not recommending it, but I do think God wants us to get ready for the broken that are coming. So come with anointing now, Lord. Anointing for the broken. The emotionally broken, the socially broken, the sexually broken. Anointing. Come with grace and mercy. The power of grace and mercy. Father, they begin to see the spirit realm with new clarity. They begin to discern when there's demonic activity, when there's angelic activity. Thank you that the angels outnumber the demons, Lord. Let us see them too. Open our eyes, Lord. This week, Lord, bring prophetic dreams. As they go to sleep tonight, Lord, begin to speak through their dreams. I pray tomorrow that we'd have to kind of unpack some, wow, I had a weird one. Okay, Lord, give us that discernment. Give us the gift of interpretation. Come, Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, for a new anointing on prophetic intercessors, intercessors that hear from heaven and do not send orders from earth to heaven, but they, they receive their orders from heaven and pray it into being. Prophetic intercessors, Lord, give the anointing, raise them up. And Lord, give us pastors wisdom to know how to deal with the holy eccentricity that prophetic intercessors walk in. They're, they're odd, Lord. We don't understand them. Give us patience with them. We need the prophetic word to be released. thing, guys, and uh, and then we'll go into some worship, because I think God wants to do some stuff through worship tonight as we close. I think most of us, probably all of us, need to repent of where we've defended the status quo and pushed the odd people out. And, and again, because they're trying to bring in something we're not used to, we often don't deal with them well. And so, Father, where we as leaders have wounded charismatics, have wounded people that they're just a little out of step with the status quo of church, Lord, would you remind us of where we need to repent? Mind 
that God sent to your church. He sent them there. And you were just a little nervous, a little afraid, and didn't know how to pastor. So Lord, give us wisdom to know how to pastor well in this season without control, without grieving or quenching the Spirit, Lord. Give us wisdom to pastor well. Receive it. This is your moment. 